السلام عليكم الصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Speaking of Quran According to the noble Quran Only the truth seekers Those seeking the right Will reach it Will understand it Not those who are escaping the truth The right they say if there was only a way we could escape the truth of God's existence, the religion, the spirituality, so we can go on and continue with our games and indulgences on anything we want. We could go after our tricks, our amusement, and whatever we want, so we don't have to worry about the judgment day, so we're not accountable. The fact of the matter is, no matter how they try, they will not escape the truth. They are often lost, gone astray, their heart is sealed, absent of seeing and hearing. They escape to things like poems, mysticism, and fantasy, which are all products of people's imagination. When they read Quran, they don't understand it. They have suspicions, doubts. They always object to this and that. Why is the Quran in Arabic? Why does it talk about violence? What about the miracles mentioned? Did they really happen or how could they happen? The angels, the spirit, and so forth. However, one who is fair-minded, seeking the truth, because of his effort, because he strives to know, God will guide him. As the Quran says, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والذين جاهدوا فينا لنهدينهم سبلنا وإن الله لمع المحسنين And for those who strive in us, strive in our cause, we surely guide them to our paths. And indeed, Allah is with the right with the good doers. Chapter 29, verse 69. This verse implies if Allah wanted, He could guide everyone. Then the concept of free will would have no meaning. So Allah says, there has to be an effort in our part in order to qualify for His guidance. It is that inch of or ounce of effort that sets us you know, set the guide, uh, sets the guided, the person who is guided and the misguided apart. Regarding those who do not seek the truth, there is a poem that says, one who has a bad taste or a bitter taste in his mouth, no matter what he eats, all tastes bitter to him. The truth seems bitter to him, and he continuously thinks, the truth is bad for him. Quran says, وَنُنَزِّلُ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ مَا هُوَ شِفَاءٌ وَرَحْمَةٌ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ فَلَا يَزِيدُ الظَّالِمِينَ إِلَّا خَسَارًا We send down in the Quran that which is a healing and a mercy to those who believe. To the unjust, to the wrongdoer, it causes nothing but loss after loss. Chapter 17, verse 82. The one who is unjust to the truth, to the right, he gains nothing but loss after loss. Therefore, we need to be fair-minded truth seekers before coming to religion and the Qur'an. We must learn to be fair-minded on anything and give the right where it's due. Once we accomplish that state, then learning about our faith and reading the Qur'an will be like drinking cool, pleasant water after a dire thirst. We then find Qur'an and Sunnah respond to us, respond to our questions and inquiries. There have been many examples throughout the history of those who were lost or misinformed or uneducated about the truth. But once they took the first step, 
realized their bias, educated themselves, then they found the truth. I have talked about Voltaire in the past, who was the famous 17th century French writer, poet, and playwright, and critic of religion. If you look at his writings, you will see his anti-Islam sentiment influenced by the priests and others. He even wrote a play about Muhammad, the prophet, where he makes fun of Muhammad and Islam as he talks about Muhammad forcing Meccans to convert to Islam. And if they did not convert, Muhammad would order their slaughter and people would laugh because it was presented as a satire, as a comedy. The play was on stage in Paris. Later, in order to gain more insight and complete his uh, comic play, he started educating himself about Islam. He started searching for the translation of Quran, those, you know, which existed at the time. Because he was being objective and fair-minded to some extent, walking into this research, he found the truth to be beside what he knew. And this can be seen in his writings over a period of time moving to later years. Finally, he said, I misjudged Muhammad and regret that. There are many in the past that have criticized Islam, but as they learn more, they realize the truth and reconsidered their position. Then, there are many critics of Islam who have ill intentions and as such focus on certain verses of the Quran, like those about violence, which applies to certain conditions, and you know, war being the last resort, hence they misrepresent Islam as a religion of violence. However, if they dig a bit deeper, read the whole passage, understand the textual and historical context, they would realize one principle that exists not just in the Qur'an, but even in the courts of law and usul. It is called the principle of the absolute, or we can call general, and the condition, which is constraint, which says the absolute cannot be applied to everything when there is a condition or a constraint. Very simple. Once all relevant scriptural passages have been collected, the quote-unquote general has to be distinguished from the quote-unquote specific and the conditional from unconditional. Also, the unequivocal passages have to be distinguished from the allegorical ones. Moreover, the reasons and circumstances for the revelation, the asbab al nuzul must be distinguished for all the passages and verses. You know, when there are clear verses in the Qur'an about, let's say, physical fighting and its conditions, one cannot apply absolute terms to make generalizations. The Qur'an explicitly divides unbelievers into two groups or two types. The first group is hostile, combative, and expels believers from their homes or <coughs> reneges on their treaties. The second group is peaceful and honor their treaties, their pledges. As the verse, uh, in, in, verse 8 in chapter 60 says, Allah forbids you not means Allah does not forbid you with regard to those who don't fight you or your faith, nor drive you out of your homes from dealing kindly and justly with them. For Allah loves those who are just. Whereas verse uh, 9, which is the second, uh, verse after this that follows, explicitly forbids surrendering to injustice. Allah only forbids you with regard to those who fight you, 
for your faith and drive you out of your homes and support others in driving you out from uh, turning to them for friendship and protection. That means don't turn to them for friendship and protection. In Islam, surrendering to oppression is considered a form of injustice. When the Quran mentions fighting, it always qualifies to do so only when faced with hostility and in no way advocates killing for other reasons, you know, like for power or territories. Therefore, how could one claim that Islam advocates killing all unbelievers? Unfortunately, there are those who do not wish to conduct a proper contextual analysis of the Qur'an, nor consider a historical perspective in order to fully understand the passages. They merely wish to use a, you know, what we call a cut and paste method to convey a biased message of their choice. They do not know or care to know about the principle of absolute and constraint. It is an injustice to generalize something which is an exception. Quran always makes exceptions and conditions very clear. A very simple one, but very clear and profound. As an example, Quran says, إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي قُسْرِ إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ This is the verse, the two verses you are very familiar with. Indeed, mankind is in loss, except those who believe and do good works. Now, what happens if someone removes the word illa uh, or accept? Accept is removed. Then it would change the meaning entirely. It says, then the, ch the meaning will change to, indeed, mankind is in loss, those who believe and do good works which will imply this would include all the prophets and the righteous people, which is dramatically wrong, just by ignoring one word, which draws the exception. Or in uh, verse 90, chapter 4, Surat An-Nisa mentions an exception and orders to stop fighting an enemy who offers peace, as it says, فَإِنِعْتَذَلُوكُمْ فَلَمْ يُغَاتِلُوكُمْ وَأَلْغَوْ إِلَيْكُمُ السَّلَمَةِ فَمَا جَعَلَ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ عَلَيْهِمْ سَبِيلًا Therefore, if they withdraw from you and fight you not, and instead send you guarantees of peace, then Allah has opened no way for you to fight them, to war against them. No matter who the enemy is, if they offer peace, you have no way to fight them. How could then we generalize the verse 89, which is the verse before it, and say fight them regardless, without any conditions or exceptions, which is always mentioned? Exceptions like when it says, those who expelled you from your home, those who expelled you from your hometown and took your possession or persecuted you and so forth and so on. Not just any non-believer. Anyone who seeks the truth can read the passage even without reading the commentaries, tafasir, and understand what Quran is referring to. Just, just reading the whole passage. That's it. However, one who has other agenda and is not really seeking the truth will object without any reason. He will conveniently drop the verse before or after or ignore part of a verse and present the other parts and say things like so and so verse said kill them wherever you find them or and those who are with him, with the Prophet, are strong against unbelievers, but compassionate amongst each other. They don't ask, which unbeliever is the verse referring to? 
Well, it already said unbelievers are two groups. One who fights you, expels you, slaughters you, the other who is in peace with you. Aren't you supposed to defend yourself against an enemy who fights you? These are people who are highly biased and unfair with other than sincere intentions. When you tell the critic his methodology is wrong, or he's looking at the wrong translation, or erroneous explanation, he says, ha, ah, no, you think only commentators and scholars understood Qur'an? No, the path to understand the Qur'an is open for all. You just have to learn the method, which, which we have discussed in the past, sessions in detail and we'll summarize today. Reading just an incomplete or wrong translation with insincere intention is not the method. Another thing that can eliminate shubahat, doubts and suspicions, is studying the seerah, life of Prophet Muhammad or his biography. If you read i just taking an example. If you read and see Ma'ad Allah, he is someone like Genghis Khan, who murdered so many without mercy, killing the young, the old, the women, the children, the defenseless. Then you can say, well, those verses of Quran are saying the same thing, and that, uh, that this was a prophet understanding, and as well as his you know, actions reflect these verses. But, if the critic goes and reads the Prophet's Sira and sees that this is a man with so much compassion that forgives the leader of the Quraysh, like Abu Sufyan, and in fact forgives all Meccans when entering Mecca and saying, Go, you are all free. After all the killing, torture, and wars they had caused. And he could have just, you know, said, kill them all. Or, when he forgives the killer of his own beloved uh, uncle, Hamza, and forgives the one who attacked his pregnant daughter and killed her unborn child. They even tried to kill him, and many, many more instances. Where he, sh where he actually showed absolute mercy. How could such a leader kill the innocent or those who are in peace with him? Then, when this critic who reads Quran, he will find those verses in line with Prophet's stance, confirming the Prophet's attitude and actions. In addition to the fact, context of the passage will also confirm, as we discussed. This is a man who understood Qur'an better than anyone else, and implemented it better than anyone else. If he behaved as such, then how could Qur'an command such unjustified violence? Therefore, the conclusion is nothing other than these critics either don't understand the verses or don't want to. That is, they're not seeking the truth. Otherwise, once they read about his life and how compassionate and lenient he was, all of which was inspired by the Qur'an, taught by the Qur'an, then they would not judge him or his book as violent and unjust. As Muslims, we should be seeking the truth rather than trying to prove our points, you know, uh, whether it's correct or not, no matter what it is. And in doing so, we should refer to the Qur'an and Sunnah because this is what is important, not our own subjective opinions. We must educate ourselves first before going out and addressing those with doubtful thoughts and the critics. In short, we must take the following key steps in understanding the Qur'an. If 
Indeed, we are seeking the truth. Number one, we must believe Quran is the true word of God. It is intact, has not been touched. Without this belief, anything can be questioned. We have already talked about the reasons that lead us to believe this book is the true word of God and will remain undistorted till end of times. Quran itself presents these proofs. Number two, we must believe Quran has no contradictions. This can also be proven by in-depth learning of the Quran. If one sees a contradiction, he must contribute it to his lack of understanding and go back and dig deeper. Number three, we must have no bias, no preconceived notions or influence. You know, we have to walk into it, you know, fair-minded, balanced. Number four, learn the conditions circumstances and historic perspective by which the verse the particular verse was revealed number five learn the general history the customs and norms within the arab society of that time number six there is apparent and then there is deeper meaning of some verses of the quran as well as the metaphors similitudes and examples in the Qur'an we should get familiar with. Number seven, read the Qur'an in its entirety, multiple times to get the full picture. Number eight, in addition to the overall Qur'anic context, consideration should be given to the sections in which particular verse occurs. One of the most common and serious mistakes is to quote only a part of a verse or one verse in an interrelated section of a surah in such a way that changes its meanings. Number nine, you must explain Quran with Quran. I repeat, we must explain Quran with Quran because Quran does explain itself. Since the Quran is not ordered by the topics, like uh, irregular textbook chapters, it is necessarily for one, it is needed, necessary for one uh, to be thoroughly familiar with other texts in the Quran, which deal with the same topic or related directly to it. If we fail to do so, may, we may lead, you know, to becoming selective, which may distort the overall message of the Qur'an concerning that topic. In fact, other texts in the Qur'an may be highly significant in determining the true meaning of a given text. Number 10. Know the difference between general meaning and the meaning of specific or minor details. Number 11, of course, there are additional tools like learning the Arabic language and studying the Prophet's life, Sirah, as we mentioned. As students of the Qur'an, we need to realize that the Qur'an has been preserved in the original language in which it was revealed, which is Arabic. In the process of translation into other languages, nuances of the original language may be lost or not fully understood because there may be words in Arabic that there are no equivalent in other languages like English. And outright mistakes occur in translations. Therefore, if you want to get a deeper understanding, make a scholarly interpretation, we need to learn Arabic language. So these in general help us understand our holy book and explain it to others. We're now ready to draft the following methodology after going through those steps. Number one, 
As a faith, we must understand and draw other people's attention to this. As a faith, Islam is not identical with the actions of some of its followers. This is extremely important. Like other religions, followers or claimed followers are imperfect. They are fallible human beings. There are times when their actions conform in various degrees to the normative teaching of their faith. But there are also times when their actions are either independent of or even in violation of such normative teachings of their faith. Offending acts are sometimes falsely committed in the name of faith. These claims are made as a result of ignorance or sincere misinterpretation or even deliberate uh, misrepresentation that are intended to provide you know, permission and authority for such acts. We can talk about examples of, you know, it include attempting to justify or explain the killing of innocent non-combatants by making out-of-context references to the Qur'an, as we talked about, you know, uh, earlier. Similarly, to justify abortion clinics, bombings, or murders, or the disposition of the Palestinian people, some make out-of-context reference to the Bible. Bible said so. History of various religious communities is full of such aberrations. Human successes or failures are not always identical with ideal norms. Number two, to evaluate whether or not a given act or argument conforms to the secondary source of Islam, you know, the, 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 the Sunnah, include consensus of the scholars you know, on a given issue, what we call ijma' and analogical deduction or qiyas and other things. Secondary sources are not explicit revelation, even though they are based on interpretation of revelation. While ijma' qiyas are more generally accepted, they are really dependent upon the primary sources for their authority and reasoning. You know, interpretation always involves human judgment, and they may vary and are fallible as well. In all cases, opinions are to be judged by the primary source, which is Qur'an, not the reverse. It may be helpful to note that there is no single person or authority in Islam whose interpretation is seen or accepted as the only valid, let alone being viewed on, in par uh, with the text of the Qur'an and Hadith. Number three, in interpretation of the Qur'an, a number of essential and universal rules must be observed. They include the following. A. Keeping in mind that some Quranic verses were revealed to deal with certain historical challenges facing the emerging and besieged Muslim community at the time. Some of these challenges may not be present, present today. And if they are, they may take a different form. Verses revealed to deal with such situations should not be unnecessarily generalized. For example, referring to verse 5 in chapter 9, which is called the sword verse, without any regard to its historical context, may give the misleading impression that the Qur'an condones killing of all idolaters rather than only those who committed or conspired with others to commit murder in violation of their treaties. So we have to be careful there. B. A text that may, be, may have more than one possible meaning. 
Sometimes that happens. Mutashabe must be interpreted in the light of more definitive text like Muhkam. Not the reverse. C. Any claim of Nasq. Nasq is abrogation. Or more correctly put, supersession. Supersession is really what Nasq means, but it's been translated as abrogation. It must be carefully examined. The entire Quran is definitely authentic. Any claim of Nasq must be definitive, not based on mere opinion or speculation. It should be noted that earlier Muslims used the term Nasq and they referred it to also as Taqsis or specifying and limiting the ruling than abrogating it. These are steps and methodologies that must be taken in order to educate oneself or others about certain topics within the Qur'an that leads to the truth. Judging an Islamic concept or Qur'anic verse, short of going through some of, it, some of these, if not all these steps, is considered injustice, leading to what? To erroneous understanding, and often escaping the truth. As advocates of truth about Islam, we must first learn about these steps and arm ourselves with the knowledge about our deen. So then we can inshallah educate other Muslims or non-Muslims who are sincerely uninformed, not the ones who are trying to escape from the truth. We ask Allah to give us patience and help us learn the Qur'an and Islam through proper methods. We put in our sincere effort, hence we ask Allah to guide us and not let us be among those who are escaping the truth. We ask Allah to forgive, to forgive our sins and our shortcomings. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر السلام على من اتبع الهدى